Greetings, everyone. Welcome in this new uh, live. <laughs> What's about to say? Welcome in this new episode. Welcome in this new live. So let's talk about Mongolia. Um, I will start uh, now just to play a song, the one that you might know from the, the Into the Meruhor show. Uh, just the time to let people connect and get into the live and then we will go into the conversation. <laughs> That, that comes from the west of Mongolia. So let's see if, oh, so good evening, good morning. Uh, I hope you had a good day or a good sleep wherever you are. So to talk about this live and how it's gonna be, what's gonna happen, the idea is that I already make a, a show about Mongolian culture, especially about the Marohor. But uh, as it 
kind of require uh, a lot of work, a lot of research. Um, I, I thought that to keep um, giving you information on a regular basis, I was thinking that maybe making a live uh, would be interesting so we could have a more informal exchange because, of course, in the show, it's like a, a very one-sided. I don't really have interaction. So the idea of the live is to be able to have a, a more informal conversation with everyone. And also, as the live uh, require much less work than uh, creating the show, there is no need to build a script or, or shoot or edit or all these kind of things. Uh, I can make the live on a regular basis. So for now, the idea is to, to have this live every Saturday uh, at 7.30 Mongolian time. And depending on how much you like it and how much uh, you, you want to, to see this live going, maybe I will add one or two or, or three more uh, session in the week. So uh, that's kind of the idea behind, behind this live to talk about Mongolia, talk about the culture, talk about the music. Maybe you have some, I don't know, speci specific question uh, about maybe how to get a Dell or how to buy a saddle from the market here or whatever. So, or even you want to come in Mongolia and you have some question about, I don't know, the guest house or how to prepare for a trip to Mongolia or about the money or whatever. So that's really the idea behind this, uh, this live. So I prepared uh, some question actually that some of my Discord uh, people ask. So I will start with uh, a question that was asked by Magne. I hope that I said the name right, Magne, uh, from our Discord community. So for the Discord, you, you can find the link in the description. If you didn't join yet, you can, um, you can join the Discord. And we have a lot of conversation. We share a lot of music. And we just talk about uh, many things there. So you can join the community. And yes, I'm French. Uh, I'm French living in Mongolia. So living in Mongolia now for six years. So I came in 2014. And that brings uh, me to that first question of Magne. So that was, what was the first thing that made you interested in Mongolian culture? So that's a question that a lot of people ask me. Um, so I, I think that's interesting to put that question first in the live to explain a bit why I came in Mongolia, how I came in Mongolia, uh, and what is this uh, magic that drives me to keep going and, and, and keep uh, researching and sharing. So uh, I, my, my background, so I'm French, uh, I've been movie director and web designer. I've been working for graphics uh, computer graphics and uh, yeah, motion design and all these kind of things for almost 20 years now. And back in Paris, so around 2012, uh, I was working like really a lot. Um, and that just ended up into me having some kind of seizure or heart attack or panic attack, or I don't know exactly what it was, but um, the accumulation of stress uh, of bad food and all these kind of bad uh, habits in life just made this kind of sickness happen. And back in that time, I had my best friend, which was working with me, which was um, a sound designer, a composer. He gave me a CD of music and was, it was Tuvan music. And he told me kind of like a joke, listen to that CD, it's going to change your life. So... Um, I listened to that CD and I was like shocked and hello, I'm Artare. So I, I, um, I listened to that CD and I was like totally shocked uh, listening this throat singing, the singing, the ikil. So that's kind of the ancestor of the Naruhod. And I listened to that music and yeah, that was like something got awo awoken inside me like there was like a little flame and it became like a very, very huge 
uh, fire. So for a few months, I listened to that one CD all the time, all over again. And after a few months of listening only one CD, of course, I got not really bored, but I was feeling like, okay, maybe I can start to listen something else to try to see where this coming is from, uh, where, is, where this music is coming from and what else there is in this mood. So I started to check on YouTube, on internet and all that, but I was like, uh, yeah, almost eight years ago. So there were, no, there were not that much information. And I found some videos of Mongolian singing uh, and playing the murhor. So that was the first time I, I saw this murhor instrument, the shape like the horse head, the very thin neck, only two strings, this big uh, box. And, and I was like, wow, this is like so awesome. Like the design of the instrument itself is, is just like so pretty. There is, I don't know, something that is very godlike in it. And when I saw that uh, back then, I, I wanted to try to play the cello. And I said, okay, I will not play cello. I will try to find this instrument. I will try to play this instrument. So it took me one year to actually find an instrument in Paris. Uh, so I, I bought uh, an instrument from a Mongolian. So that, that was also a pretty interesting story uh, on how I got this instrument. Maybe I will tell uh, later. And once I got this instrument, the first time I played, I had a very big uh, emotion coming out. I cried a lot. And that was like meeting a friend that I missed for a long, long, long time. So I hey, how are you, uh, Engira? So um, that was really, really mind-blowing experience just the first time I played the instrument and I understood that this instrument was not just a musical instrument there were something else uh, with that instrument with that music so I actually didn't play it for a while until I could find someone that could guide me and uh, in Paris, it took me again a few months to find a person that would be able to teach me. So that was a girl uh, named Bujigma. She graduated from the art school in Mongolia and she's a murderer. So um, she started to teach me a bit the background and, and the ideas behind the murderer, how the, the, the melodies and all that. So then I, I could start to, to learn uh, this instrument. And parallel to all that, I, I kind of started to get into a more spiritual path um, because the, this music is very spiritual, is very uh, spirit connected, I would say, or with very connected with the energy. So on the side to, to kind of help me um, get out of this stressful, overworking, uh, I'll say, life in Paris. I quit everything. And on one side, there were the music, there were the Mongolian culture. And on the other side, I was starting to, to get more spiritual, read more philosophical things and all that. So this music, this culture, and this instrument really, really supported this kind of life switch. So it, it was really, really uh, helpful. So that's why I, I really love this culture because it's a lifesaver for me. And then after a while, starting to learn, getting more spiritual, uh, kind of getting out of my comfort zone, if I would say, I decided to go uh, to Mongolia. So I went to Mongolia and I didn't really come back to France after all that. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of like uh, the idea. Hey, Bjorn. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are Saturday, right? So yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that's today. That's today. That's right now. <laughs> so that's, that's for the, um, that's for the, this question of what bring me in Mongolia and what makes me so in love uh, with this culture. So I think, so pro Project 1312, has anyone else tried to make a murderer? I tried about five years ago. Um, and it's not that great. It played very poorly, but it was fun to make. Oh, that's great. I would be really uh, curious 
to to see what you what you made the murder hole you made and and how you what was the process and how it ended up so about the making of the murder hole i actually made few instruments so this instrument here that you can see in the show uh that's my baby so that's the murder hole i made like now three years ago i made the bow as well so that was a three months uh work and that was quite uh intensive and 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 fun to do so i, I will see the other uh question that was on the discord oh yeah sure Oh, I'm not expecting anything. Just I'm just curious to see where the creativity of people uh, is leading uh, when it comes to murder horse. So I'm really, really curious. And yeah, share on Discord and share with everyone. I, I'm pretty sure everyone would be happy to, to see your work. So uh, another question also from Agne on the Discord. Um, so let me uh, check that. Is there a way to prepare the horse hair that will be used for murder horse strings and for the bow. So yes, there is a specific way to, to make the horsehair string. So for the bow, um, for, for the strings and the bow anyway, we need to clean, of course, the, the horse hair because when we take it from the horse, it's dirty. So it needs to be cleaned with soap, uh and, and and all that until it's really clean and and it's it's getting very smooth um there is nothing very specific about the cleaning i would say it's just like a very simple cleaning but for the, the 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 strings actually it needs to be bred directly on the instrument um, if not, it, it's, it's just going to result to have like the string having some hair very loose and then you, you, you will not have a very, very good sound. So, so the idea is to first uh, count the hair actually uh, to have the right thickness for the strings and also to have the right tension. So first count the, the strings. So it's like 105, 105. Uh, 15 usually it's kind of this idea but it can it can change a little bit depending on the size of the instrument also uh, depending on the style of the making of the person but usually it's like around 105 and 115 then once you have the two uh, strings we uh, kind of fix it on the tail here and then comb the hair until that area. So here you can see it's breaded, yeah, on this area. So the idea is to always keep the tension uh, on the string while breading the hair. Um, that's very important because if not, some hair just gonna get loose and the sound not, not gonna be very pretty. It's, it's gonna be very windy sound like, like this. So um, for the horse hair, usually it's, it's very important to make the, the string directly on the instrument to always have this tension while breading and to have the, the best sound possible with the string. With the nylon, it's possible to bread it uh, just on a table or something to keep it for later because the nylon is more uh, flexible. So... Um, so we can keep the nylon string for longer. Also, it's not as sensitive to the warmth, to humidity and everything. So with the nylon, it can be prepared before, beforehand and then put on the instrument later. Like you can have some spare string. But with the horsehair, um, it's not that recommended, I would say, because the hair might break or just get used. It needs to keep the tension uh, all the time. So that's for uh, to talk about the, the strings. So let's get to um, the next question, which is from Robert. So also from the Discord uh, community. What are your plans for preserving Mongolian culture? So that's a very also interesting question. 
My plans to, to help uh, promote the Mongolian culture and to help preserve uh, the culture is first, of course, to learn it myself, to live it myself. So as some of you might know, I live in Mongolia for now uh, six years, and I'm not just learning the Merhor, or I'm not just learning the music. I'm also learning, of course, the language. I went to 15 of the 21 province uh, of Mongolia. Uh, I went in the countryside quite a lot. Uh, I talk a lot also with, of course, the natives about their traditions, the culture, uh, their habit or how they perceive the philosophy of the culture, the songs and all that. And of course, the language, as you can see, I, I also learned the calligraphy. So what is very important is to, in my opinion, what is very important to preserve the culture and to promote it, it's to promote it um, horizontally, I would say, not just one topics, uh, but um, the music with the language, with the traditions, with the history, everything need to be uh, shared in parallel, I would say. So um, for me, of course, now I'm starting my master degree, uh, which is about translating long song praise um, and eventually epics at some points. And on the other side, it's the study and the research about the ancestral Mongolian philosophy. Uh, so maybe related to the, to the Tengrism, to the shamanism, and, and maybe even before all that. So that's the idea. And then, of course, share, share, share as much as I can with you guys, uh, which I know you are very, very passionate. And I'm just trying to give as much information as I can um, and share as much as I can from what I learned from my experience. So that, that's the idea. And, and the format would be uh, now I'm working on a book, um, also doing this uh, cultural show, now starting to make these lives uh, and share the information. So that's the idea behind um, the, the preservation, the sharing of the Mongolian culture. So an, another um, question also from Robert. So let me read that. What was your journey? Uh, oh, sorry. What has your journey in Mongolia taught you in terms of personal life? How were your moral and well-being influenced by the culture? So as I already answered a little bit in the first question, uh, the main thing that Mongolia taught me is patience, <laughs> because in Mongolia, uh, there is no time. I mean, uh, there is no schedule. Uh, things can start with 10 hour uh, delay. So it, it, there is no time in this country. It's very freestyle. It's very related to the nomadic lifestyle. Uh, in, in, in the countryside, we never say, OK, I'm going to arrive in an hour. Uh, we always say, I'm, I'm going to arrive in one kilometer or 10 kilometer. We never know what's going to happen on the way. Uh, if we meet someone, then we just start to talk with them and, and drink some tea and maybe sing and maybe dance or, or whatever, or, or a tire might break and then, or we can get in the sand or whatever. So th there is really, really uh, no time philosophy, even in the, in, even in the city, and uh, in the in the city work, or like I, I played in some movies and and, and stuff and stuff like that. And yeah, there is absolutely no schedule. So from from a French point of view, where everything need to be super sharp in time, like if I say ten, it need to be ten. Uh, that was very uh, how to say confusing in the beginning because. Uh, I remember when I went to Ovs, we waited a bus for like 10 hours. Uh, it was supposed to come in the morning and it just arrived in, in almost in the night. And we just waited. We just waited on, on the bus stop for like the full day. And when the bus came, it was normal. It wasn't like, oh, sorry or whatever. So it, it's just like how it is. So it's really uh, teaching how to, to get out of this comfort zone, how to just accept 
things the way it is. Um, and so that, that might be a little bit difficult for European or eventually American mindset that, that need to be a little bit in a more strict uh, schedule. But uh, the other side of this thing that can be a little bit difficult is that everything can, can just start uh, magically like that. So it can, we can go in the countryside and then we thought we would just go for one hour, just quickly, briefly do something and then go back. And actually, when we get there, we meet a new person that's going to bring us somewhere else. And then we just end up, uh, uh, I don't know, spend two nights or three nights and discovering new things. So it, it's also very, very uh, interesting. Uh, we never know what's going to happen next. So that, that would be really what, what this country and what this culture taught me. It's the passions and, and also um, the acceptation of right now, what's going on right now. Uh, every, every second, every minute is full of surprise. We never know what's going to happen in the, next, uh, in the next moment. So I, I really love uh, this culture for that because it's always full of surprise. Um, and it's, it, in a way, it also makes uh, the philosophy, the mindset, the body much more calm. There is no need to rush. Uh, it's just going to happen when it's going to happen. And it's all about being peaceful uh, and enjoy the moment. So that, that's really the, the thing that Mongolia taught me very, very deeply <laughs> after all these uh, six years. So I hope that answered the, the question. Um, so, and now maybe a last question, maybe a little bit more technical about the Maruhor. This question come also from Discord, from Denise. Just wanted to know about the pressure we should put on the string when we are playing. So about the murder, that's also a question that comes uh, quite often. So, hey, gaming ghost, how are you? So I will just give you some insight. Just let the camera a bit further. Uh, a bit of insight about the pressure that uh, we need to put on the string when we play. Usually, the pressure on the string, so with the left hand, is very close to the pressure that we put with the bow. So if, if, if I give you an example, let's say I put one Newton of strength with uh, the finger, it's going to be one Newton strength with the bow, usually. Or the bow is slightly uh, stronger. So what is very important is not actually the strength. Uh, and the pressure on the string. It's more about the angle. So I already explained that a little bit um, in, a, in a previous Into the Murder Hole episode, but I will maybe get into more detail uh, right now. So now on the empty string. So you can see that the idea of the strength on the string is kind of like going a little bit forward and going on the side. If I push toward myself, the sound gonna be very, very um, strident, like a whistle. But now I push a little bit forward, kind of into that direction. Then um, that's how, that's how you, you make it sound good. So are there any words? I will read after that. So that, that's really um, more about the angle and less about the pressure. So it's more kind of a little bit forward, frontward. And there is not much difference between the lower string and the higher string or with the little finger when we go below that, that uh, lower string, there is not much difference of pressure or of angle. Uh, it's all very similar, so... So you see, the idea, the angle is kind of like this. So it's very forward, a little bit on the side and very forward. 
And you can see that I'm barely pushing. I don't even need to, to take um, or to say support on the neck uh, to push. And if you check closely the string, the string is not bent that much. So again, most people try to push a lot uh, on the string, especially toward themselves, because we, we have this idea of pushing the string to the neck uh, because of the guitar playing or this kind of instrument. On the motherboard, that's very different. It's really pushing forward. And also, I would uh, really recommend to stay relaxed as relaxed as you can when you are playing. Because I see a lot of people and most of my students also kind of make this mistake. It's to play very, very fast uh, and in a very stiff way. So the idea is really to go slowly, just to feel. And first, um, just the empty string to feel the bow. Once you can feel the bow and go slowly, peacefully, you see, it's not about having uh, the shoulder very stiff and stressed, always very relaxed. Then you can start to put a finger and you don't need to, to, to go to the scale or to do a crazy exercise uh, directly. You can just play one note for a while, maybe one bow, two bow, three, four bow, until it gets comfortable. And once this one note is comfortable, okay, you can switch to the next finger and so on. But if you get directly into a very fast move, a uh, very stiff and stressed move, of course, it's just gonna build more and more and more stress and this, this is not going to work because the more relaxed you are, the more the string going to ring well. Because if I also give this example, let's say this is the string and let's say this is your finger. If you have tension in your finger, it's kind of like having the, the, the surface of contact of your finger being like this. Then the string not going to really uh, get with your finger together. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm clear enough. If you are relaxed, it's really gonna um, hug perfectly, if I could say. So the, the contact surface gonna be bigger and then the string gonna vibrate better. So relax is the first key point of having a good sound. And the second key point is the angle where you put uh, and how you put the finger on the string. And the last point is the pressure, but the pressure is very soft. There is um, no need to put like a super strong pressure. And also you asked about this kind of like whistle um, style. Uh, the whistle style is also used. So it's when we still keep playing the bow normally but we only barely touch the string. So it's used to, to make this kind of wind effect uh, on the motherboard. So for, for this kind of effect, the bow still played normally but we only put the string, uh, we only put the finger on the string without any pressure. So it's kind of creating uh, harmony and it's used to make this like uh, whistle uh, sound. So I hope that it answers um, the question. So let's see about Bjorn, you will. Are there any musicians you would recommend for research when practicing this instrument? Um, well, you, I can actually 
maybe put a list of some artists um, on Discord. Um, I usually try also to share some link, some links there. But um, I would say that you can listen to Batu Zhongguai, which is the founder of the Meruhur Choda. Uh, also, of course, Jamyang, Jamyang Gui. Uh, as we, we, we saw in a previous episode of Into the Meruhur, they are very, very big uh, figure of the Meruhur. So that's uh, really music and, and musician that you need to, to listen to because they really set kind of a standard uh, of Meruho playing, they really set a, a style, uh, they give uh, kind of the modern soul of the instrument. Um, and on the side, then that would be more like, if you like the traditional Meruho, uh, that's really kind of like trying to get uh, videos and recording from the countryside, from Herder, from the countryside. And for that, that's a little bit more rare. That's a little bit more difficult to, to find, especially on internet and all that. But you can already start with Ba Chou Zhong, Ba Chou and Jamyang Gui. And I can share with you some links uh, on Discord uh, if you want to. So that was for the question of Bjorn. So I don't have any suggestion. However, if you make a mistake while playing, you can always say it a style from one of the lost tribe. <laughs> That's very interesting. Actually, uh, some of uh, the 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 music sometimes it's kind of work like that. Uh, some tribes they kind of copy another one and then they change some stuff or do some kind of mistake or just change one and then say ah actually it was ours. So even for the research, it's very confusing sometimes because melodies looks a lot alike, but uh, they can be borrowed, changed a little bit. And so, so yeah, that, that's quite interesting. <laughs> and also Gaming Ghost asks, just a quick question. Have you been in Inner Mongolia? So I've been in Inner Mongolia very shortly, only for a few days uh, for a concert. Uh, and it was not the deep inner Mongolia that was still very close to the Mongolian border. Uh, but I had the, the chance to meet with uh, quite a few inner Mongolian. And, um, and they have also their very own style. Uh, they have their own personality. And, and I don't know, they, they really play with the heart. Uh, I mean, for from what I saw, the modern comp composition, um, when it comes from Inner Mongolia, there is really something special in it that's very interesting. And you might all, I, I hope you, you know, and you might know Chibutlak, right? which is like, wow, uh, one of the best murders I ever heard, if not the best. And he composed like a, a dozen of, melodies that are like really really beautiful so um it's not really i would not say that it's that traditional um but it's really a new uh style of the murder and, and chibut like well also is uh, someone that you really need to listen to but it's a little bit more modern and as uh, you might all know inner mongolia is part of uh china so of course the Chinese music, the Chinese culture influenced um, the, the, the Mongolian music in that area. So also that's very interesting to see the difference between Inner Mongolian music, the center of Mongolia and the west of Mongolia uh, related to the difference of geography, the difference of uh, the landscape, and of course the influence of Russia from one side and the influence of China on the other side. So I think it's very important and very interesting to listen to every different uh, style and di different region uh, because it gives a better idea of what is the old Maruho, the traditional one, the 
evolu uh, the evolution of it, like the, the kind of European modern, more like Asian modern. And so it's super rich. So Chivodak also is quite uh, amazing, actually, to, to listen to. So that was about Inner Mongolia. And yeah, that's definitely interesting to see uh, how this murder evolved, how this music evolved, uh, and how the environment uh, um, influenced the, the music, the play style, the shape of the instrument. Like, so maybe we'll, we'll talk in detail a bit more about this evolution uh, in the next live. So I think that's it for today's uh, live session. So as usual, you can like and you can share uh, this video if you liked it. If you want to join the community uh, of Discord, the Discord community, definitely please uh, check the link in the description. Join there and share your ideas, share your creation, share uh, your music, share uh, your love and your passion for Maluhur or for throat singing or even for Urtindo, long song. Um, so join the Discord, please, and share the, the love and the passion with us. So um, I, I will say that I hope to make this uh, live session every Saturday and that it will grow with you guys. So if you have any question, things that you wanted to know, or you need an opinion or whatever, join the Discord and leave the question there. Or you can even put the, the question or your interrogation in the comment of this uh, live session. So I think that's it. I hope that you enjoyed. And until next time, may the blessing of the eternal blue sky be upon you. <laughs>